back, welcome back, welcome back. I'm Lisa Blackburn and this is my YouTube channel where we talk about everything I want to, science and math. And today we're talking about quantum physics. How cool is that? All right, so uh, for our notes today, we're gonna try to do the whole notes for this unit today. Uh, there might be a little bit I have to go back and add, but we can be pretty close. All right, so part of this we've already learned. The test on this is gonna be the Friday before fall break. So if you are taking off that day early for grandma's house or something, uh, you can take it early. Just let me know. Any question about that? All right, this is a fun one. Because, don't tell anybody, but school is sometimes boring because you learn the same thing over and over again. Today, you're going to learn something brand new. Yay! We're excited about that, right? Uh, Press, is that your calculator or phone? Phone, she go, phone in the book bag, book bag in the cubby. Phone in the book bag, book bag in the cubby. All right, so we're going to be talking more about radioactivity. So this is a part of chemistry that is really dominated by physics. So if you really like this unit and you want to grow up and do this for a living, you would probably actually be a physicist, not a chemist because physics is sort of like the parent study discipline to chemistry. Chemistry, uh, we teach this, but if you wanna go deeper in it and where you're gonna go deeper in it is physics. Okay, so we learned this before. Which element is the last naturally occurring element? Does anybody remember that from when we learned before? What? Yes, Kendall Guy, it's uranium. Elements over, hold on, I gotta get my pen going here. Elements over 92, just like she said, uranium, are synthetic. They're man made, not found in nature. And um, they're made, where are they made? Are places like the Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland. And it's this, these are some of you read in your book yesterday. So these are some of the largest man-made structures on earth and the one in switzerland goes around a whole city and it's controversial there are people who think that it's good that they don't want to be near it that's going to cause cancer there were people who thought when they turned it on it was going to cause microscopic black holes and things or people could just start disappearing kind of like when ultron snaps his fingers so it didn't so nobody disappeared but it keeps breaking it gets so hot it breaks and then all these people who are against it are happy if you go look on the internet uh only with your parents permission and supervision there are pictures of people who believe that it causes weird weather over the city where it is and you can see the pictures and it does look weird i don't know if those pictures have been doctored but i'm glad they decided to build it in switzerland and not atlanta you know or dallas georgia so anyway they they're making elements now you learned this when we did our FET interactive lab, that elements can be unstable. Remember that? Where you would mess the, with the protons and the neutrons, and if you got the right ratio, it was stable, but if you didn't, it was unstable. Remember that? So elements, most elements are stable, but it depends on the ratio of, in which you discovered in our inquiry-based lab of protons to neutrons. And in fact, you can graph it. Can I scroll? I'm gonna go over here and scroll. Uh, yes. you, you can graph it, and it makes a nice little line of the band of stability. So, so it's really neat, and this is what I was telling you about. You remember Mendeleev didn't dis invent the periodic table, he discovered it, the patterns were always there in nature. This is another math pattern in nature. The periodic table, if you graph the neutrons versus the protons, you get this line, nice little line. You know math is graphs, straight, nice little line that's, that's uh, built into the design of all of these elements. There's this wonderful little nice line, which is the band of stability. So if you've got the ratio of neutrons to protons right, it'll make this lovely little line. If it is off this way, you end up getting one kind of decay. If it's off this way, you get a different kind of decay. And the kind of decay depends on that ratio. So that's kind of interesting. There's my uranium there. You can put little, you can put little radiation lines coming out from that when you color it. All right, I'm going to 
this goal again. I mean, it seems to work better if I do it over here. So I know it makes great TV for me to wander out of the screen, but at least I'm still talking. All right. So all elements over number 83 are unstable and give off radiation. So especially, the, remember I told you that these elements sometimes are too fat? They seem to have too many neutrons and they just fall apart and they give off radiation. Well, all the ones that are 83 are radioactive. So what, what they eject radiation and that's particles and energy from the nucleus. Shh, y'all listening? Um, so the unit of radiation was named after one of the scientists we know who is too modest to name an element after herself. It is the curry. It's the unit of radiation. That's what probably killed her. But hey, she got it named after her. The unit of radiation. It's the amount of radiation given off by one gram in one second. Some types of radiation we already, I taught you all about this in unit two as a little pre-learning. One type is called an alpha particle. It's really a helium atom. Um, and it has a positive charge. So it's a helium atom that has lost electrons. The symbol for it is like this little A, or sometimes it's written like this, showing that it's a helium atom. Remember, that's the number of protons and that's the mass. Or sometimes it's written the, the protons and the mass with the little alpha symbol. That's the Greek letter alpha. Don't you feel smart? You're learning Greek. You know it's smart when you're learning Greek letters. You're doing something smart. The next one is the beta particle. It's really an electron being ejected. It has, so what charge would it have if it's an electron? Negative. Negative, that's right. It's got a negative charge. It's, and oh, alpha particles can be stopped by skin, but you wouldn't want to ingest them or breathe them in. That could cause damage, cancer, things like that. Beta particles is an electron and it can pass through skin. So it's more dangerous, it's more high energy. So I got a little story about alpha particles. When I was in uh, college, one of my jobs was I was a student chemistry a teacher. I would do um, study classes where the students would, like if they were failing, they would have to come to my study class or they could just come, athletes had to come. And then I also did helping with lab. The professor would come in and teach the lab and then he'd leave. He'd, he'd teach the ideas behind it and then he'd leave. And I was the person who actually taught the lab. So one time in college, we were doing a lab with alpha particles with radiation. Now you will not do a lab like that. I don't do any labs that could give you cancer. Aren't you grateful for that? But not college. We were doing a lab with alpha particles and the alpha particles came in this little cardboard little canister, like a little bitty oatmeal container, but, but that big around that, that tall. And then I took this activator and I squirted it in each one and gave them to the students. They used their Geiger counter or whatever it was, and they would measure the radiation being given off by the alpha particles. So then uh, the students were turning in their little things at the end, and I'm taking them up and putting them in this very carefully and putting them in this special thing to dispose of radioactive substances and and each student would bring it up and hand it to me and I would put it in the little thing. Well there was this athlete guy, big old guy, he comes up, I hold out my hand for it and he does this. He turned, it was this hand, he turned it upside down and just poured it in my hand. So I had radiation just dripping down my arm and it was interesting since I didn't die or get cancer at that moment, maybe one day, but uh but it was interesting because I could feel the heat. It was so hot and you couldn't really see it. It was like invisible, this invisible hot thing going down my arm. But I was so angry. Who does this? Here you've got this little cup of radiation and he comes and pours it on in my hand. So I've been had radiation poured on me and uh, nitric acid and I still don't have superpowers. TV has lied to me. I should have superpowers by now. Anyway, so that was my alpha particle. So in lab, be careful. Don't don't dump radiation on your teacher. Okay, next I'm gonna scroll again. Beta particles. I want to say a little bit more about them. Okay. The symbol for beta particle is this Greek letter B. It's also sometimes written like this. 
What is the mass of an electron pretty close to? Zero. Somebody whispered it. Y'all are not confident in your answers, but you're right. So the mass of an electron is pretty much zero, especially compared to a proton. What's the charge of an electron? Negative. Negative. So you write negative one zero and a lowercase e. Remember I told you I was annoyed at that worksheet, but not enough to rewrite it, where they were using big E for electron, but big E is energy, little, little e is electron. And sometimes they'll write it like this. The zero, negative one, and then the beta symbol. And a lot of times that beta symbol is not closed. It's like a capital B with a tail that's kind of curly, and it's, sometimes it's not closed right there. Another thing I want you to know about beta particles or electrons, I left this off your notes. It will be typed in future editions, but I want you to write down. Electrons are considered both a wave and a particle because it's got... P-A-R-T-I-C-L-E-S. It's both a wave and a particle. And the reason why is it has a wavelength. It's like light, but it's also like a particle. It can do things like you can have a beam of electrons and shine at some metal, and it will cause the metal atoms to splash. So it can act like a particle. And I'm going to show you a device that is similar to the one they used when they discovered this experiment. Not today. So, but I wanted to show you this, that the symbol for wave is this. It looks like an upside down Y or a little TP. That's the symbol for wavelength. And you're gonna learn that in physics also. Um, the, with it being a, because electrons have a wave and a wavelength, that's how electron microscopes use. And you saw when they looked at Remember the guy who had the, uh, showed the crystal lattice and they had the, the molecule and were turning it in that movie? You saw some electron microscope images in that. Um, okay, so the next kind is called gamma that we're gonna talk about. So just so smart learning all these Greek letters. Gamma rays, we've talked about them before. They're really a type of electromagnetic radiation. Big E energy, it's like light. It's like a type of light. And light is part of electromagnetic radiation, but it's only one part of it. It's Ronald McDonald, it's very ugly, extra gross, radio, microwaves, infrared, visible, UV, x-rays, gamma rays. And we've learned that before. It will be on this test. Um, uh, gamma rays have no charge. They're only stopped by lead or several meters of concrete. So this is the highest form of energy is the gamma ray part of it. Um, so it is that, the gamma rays right there. The symbol for it looks like the astrological sign Aries. Um, and so it looks kind of like little horns. And, but it sometimes is written like this. It's like the horns, but with no mass and no charge by it. Does that make sense? Okay, there's another thing that can be ejected. It's called a, it's a neutron and it's called a neutrino. I think it sounds like a fun little nickname. Oh, you cute little neutrino. It's, it's so, uh, it's ejected. Its symbol is little n. I told you that that was the symbol for neutron. It is also sometimes written like this. One showing it has a mass of one zero showing it has no protons in a lowercase n. And remember, I was annoyed at that worksheet because they had an uppercase n for neutron. Uppercase n is nitrogen. It is not neutron. Okay, there is a, another one, and really there's a bunch of this, of these that you can learn in physics, but like there's gluons and mesons and all kinds of subatomic particles. But here's another one that we're going to talk about. It's called a positron, and it's like a positive electron. So these are all things that would not have been part of Dalton's atomic theory of matter. He didn't know about subatomic particles. So for the symbol for the positron, they will, they will do a little e like an electron, but put a plus next to it, a little plus e. They will also do the beta symbol, but put a plus down where the negative one goes. And they will also do 
the zero and the plus with a lowercase e. But it's like a positive electron. And what this actually is, is antimatter. I guess I'll write it here. So have you ever heard of antimatter? There's matter and then there's antimatter, which is sort of like it's equal and opposite. And if they collide, they annihilate each other. So if an electron and a positron collide, they annihilate each other. So there are lots and lots and lots of sci-fi jokes about this about an astronaut going to another, uh, another planet and meets the aliens and it looks like him and they shake hands and boo, and annihilate each other. There's lots of little cartoons and jokes and sci-fi on based on this idea of antimatter, which you can learn more about in physics. All right, next idea. You are doing good so far. Hanging in there, but so far it's not too hard. Good job. Can I scroll all the way? Somebody object. All right, we're going on to the laws of nature. Okay, so the laws of nature are not like the laws of man. They cannot be broken. So these are laws that govern the universe. It's the science laws that everything follows, like gravity. Gravity is a law. It's not a suggestion. You jump off the Empire State Building without a parachute, you die at the bottom, right? Okay, gravity. It's the law. Okay, well, here's some more laws. The first one, oh, I'll skip the page somewhere. Yep, right here is the law of conservation. This is not like recycle, save the planet conservation. This is this, that matter and energy cannot be created or destroyed. Just change forms from one to another. What you put in is what you get out, get out right. Okay, so let's talk about this. So we have to assume that there was a beginning. In the beginning, there was a beginning, right? But we, but and at that point, there had to have been some sort of creation. There had to have been some way that matter was created. And how we know that is we got matter now. If there's a painting, there must have been a painter. There's stuff, there, there must be some place that stuff came from, okay? So there had to be a point of, of atoms being made. But we don't address that in science. Okay, so there's a point where every, all the atoms started. But since then, since that point of creation, you cannot make an atom. You, can, you cannot create an atom or energy. It only changes from one form to another. Okay, does that make sense? You can't make atoms. You only change them from one form to another. And so, so that means in chemistry, what you put in is what you get out. You cannot make matter. Everybody got, does that make sense to you? I mean, as much sense as it can make to anybody. <laughs> but does it make sense where you can follow, okay, you can agree to this and move forward from this point. There's one little twist to this. Matter and energy cannot be created or destroyed, only change from one form to another. But Einstein, why, why he's so smart and why we still call smart people Einstein is he figured out the famous formula E equals MC squared, which is saying that matter and energy can change from one to another. So you can take matter and turn it into energy and theoretically you can take energy and turn it into matter. Mind blown, right? We blowing your mind? Okay. So that's the law of conservation of matter and energy. The next one is the law of multiple proportions, okay? And it is in chemistry compounds like H2O. The subscripts are whole numbers. And this is what John Dalton figured out way back when, that it's whole numbers, not fractions. Water is H2O. It is never uh, H2.503.75. No, we'll put a big no buster through that. No, it's all it's whole numbers. And Dalton figured that out. And also, when uh, we watched our video, remember when he had the water and he was shocking it? And he said, there's something about water that seems to know math, because we did this all day, but every time it was two parts hydrogen and one part oxygen, there was always something left over. Remember that part of the video? That's this, this is the law of multiple proportions, that it's going to be whole numbers, not fractions. There's something about chemistry, there's something about the atoms that knows math. One of my favorite quotes of all times is the whole thing, the whole thing's based on math. Everything is math, and math is very high order, right? So just 
gives me a little chill thinking about it. It probably didn't y'all, but I know more about the math than you do and how complicated it is. Okay, the next one is called the law of definite proportions. The formulas for compounds don't change. Now, a triangle is the Greek letter delta, and it means change or difference in math and chemistry. And I want you to know it and start using it. So big E is energy, triangle is change. If you don't know that, write it out to the side. That triangle means change, and the, the subscripts for a compound don't change. That's what makes it what it is. So, what's the formula for water? What is it? H2O. It's always H2O. It's not H2O2. If it was H2O2, what would it be? Does anybody know? What? Yes, y'all are so shy. It's hydrogen peroxide. Say your, your knowledge with pride. It's hydrogen peroxide. Can you drink hydrogen peroxide and sell water? No, you will die. Hydrogen peroxide that you get at the drugstore is 3%. 3. 97% water. You can swish your mouth with it. If you have ulcers in your mouth, you'll be fine. 30% is what strips your hair blonde. If you've heard of a bleach blonde, it's not usually bleach, it's hydrogen peroxide. Uh, so imagine drinking 100% hydrogen peroxide. It would kill you very fast, wouldn't it? It would destroy your esophagus and your probably your lungs. So you change those little numbers, you've changed the chemical, it's not the same anymore. Good? Okay. So the next idea is nature likes balance. This is, I always do this like I, I'm being a scale going, ooh. So when y'all are doing something wrong that's out of balance and I start doing this, I'm not an airplane, I'm a scale. See my scale over in the box? My old school gave that to me while I left. Isn't it pretty? It's an antique scale. Okay, nuclear equations must be balanced. In unit four, next unit, we're gonna learn how to balance chemical equations, but we're gonna start with nuclear equations and they are different. Nuclear chemistry is different, that's what we're doing now, than regular chemistry, which we'll pick up unit four. Okay, let's scroll. Not let's roll, let's scroll. Okay, so when you write a chemical reaction, and I know some of y'all have told me you learned this in eighth grade, the reactants are written on the left, that's what you put in. The products, that's what you get out, are written on the right. And in between goes an arrow. That arrow you can think of as an equals. And uh, because and, and what you put in is what you get out, so it must be equal on both sides. It must be equal on both sides. Let me get on the right page. Okay, now, for a nuclear equation, Things could, there's some different ways to make them happen. They could, the, the nuclear isotope could just fall apart, giving off radiation, or it could be helped along. So one way to uh, help it along is by splitting the atom, like how Otto Hahn and Fritz Streisman did, and Lisa Meitner understood it. Remember that story? Okay, so what is it called when you split the atom? Remember what this is? Fission. Fission, because there's your fish, and we're cutting it in half. It's fission. So fission is splitting the atom. Let's erase that. Let's start over. Fission is splitting the atom. It's, uh, if it's a bomb, this is the nuclear chemistry used in bombs. To make a bomb, one atom is not a bomb. Okay, you have to have it so when, so when Strauss and Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann uh, split the atom on accident, they did not blow up their lab. Okay, they got some weird data, but they didn't blow up their lab. To make a bomb, you have to have enough stuff. Now, enough stuff doesn't sound very sciencey, does it? And as, as scientists, we're nerds, and we want to sound smarter than everybody else, so we use nerdy, sciencey words. It's all part of the game of just trying to look smarter than everybody else. Okay, and so we don't call it enough stuff. We call it the critical mass. Doesn't that sound much more sciencey? Yeah. So you need the critical mass. That's just science talk for enough stuff to make a bomb. Now, why do you need enough stuff? Why doesn't one atom make a bomb? It, because you have to have enough stuff 
to start a chain reaction. And we're gonna do a little lab with this. We will not use any actual nuclear stuff very much in this. It will be dominoes. We're gonna do a domino lab where we're gonna do chain reactions. And so what happens is one atom splits, okay? And then it flies off in two parts. Well, those two parts can knock into two more atoms and then they're gonna split. And now we have four parts and then they're gonna split and it will be eight parts. It's an exponential increase. And it could be three becomes six, becomes uh, uh, 18, whatever, like that. So it could, it could be by threes or by twos, but it's an exponential increase, okay? Um, it's also used, in a, fission is what's also used in our nuclear power plants. Now, nuclear power is controversial. It's in the news. Uh, right now, it's in the news because uh, Russia and Ukraine are fighting. We're on team Ukraine, and, uh, and so is Europe. And so Russia supplies oil to Europe for their heating and all their energy needs. Well, they're cutting it off. This week they said, no more oil for you, quit bombing us. And so Europe is gonna have just this huge energy crisis and it might affect us too, okay? So a lot of people are going, we should not be dependent on oil, we should be using green energy so that, so, and we have decided that nuclear power plants is green energy because you don't, it doesn't run by carbon, it runs by nuclear power, okay? So what they do with the nuclear power is they, it's hot. Remember I told you when the alpha particles were on my arm, they were hot? So it's hot. As it's undergoing fission, it's giving off heat. And that heat is used to boil water, to make steam, to blow a pinwheel, to move magnets near a wire, and it makes electricity, okay? So there are some people who go, this is great. It has a zero carbon footprint. We need more nuclear power plants. There are other people who usually, these are probably people who are on the same side of the political spectrum. They would have both voted for the same candidate for president, okay? But there's another group in this same political party who says, no, this is no good. It is bad for the environment because when you get through having the nuclear power, you've got nuclear waste. You've got leftover radioactive material. What are you going to do with it? It takes tens of thousands of years to get rid of. We're not even talking our grandkids' lives. We're talking you know, future man way, way down the road is still going to be dealing with this nuclear waste. That's pollution. Pollution is not green. Do you see the, the controversy here? I've always been a little like, yeah, I don't know. It's out of my pay scale. Until there was the, there was a nuclear power plant in Japan. They had an earthquake that caused a tsunami and that thing cracked open. People died. Lots of um, ladies miscarried their babies, like 20,000. Other people just cooked like a hot dog from the inside out. More people committed suicide because it was Japan and they were, had a lot of honor. So if they worked at the power plant and everything went wrong, they went and killed themselves. All kinds of mess. That thing is still, today, it is leaking nuclear radiation into the ocean, which is washing up in California on, the, on, the, on our California coast on our west coast. So the, the water over there is radioactive. There's gonna be people getting cancer surfing over in California. So now I've decided that nuclear power plant's okay, but the problem is, is what if there's an earthquake again? Now is, the, is it very likely? I don't know. Earthquakes happen every day, I don't know. So now I'm against it, I've decided it's too dangerous. But do, should you think it's too dangerous? No. You should make up your own opinion about this. Just know that this is something that as you'll be grown soon, you'll be voting. This is one of the issues. For nuclear power or against it. I've decided I'm against it. It's too dangerous. But I do have a little addendum to this. When I taught at Pebblebrook in Cobb County, I had a nuclear chemist come speak to my class. He was the dad of one of my students. And so he worked at one of these nuclear power plants. You cannot imagine how much money this man makes. This is one of the top paid positions ever. So if you want to be extremely rich and you think nuclear power is A-OK, -okay, this is a path to great riches. I was so shocked how much money he makes because he's like the chief chemist and went in charge of one of these nuclear power plants. And my goodness, you talk about money. He is absolutely rich. Okay. 
So anyway, there you go. Okay, uh, nuclear power plants. Okay, so what's the other one? Not fission, what's the other one? Fusion. Fusion, and that's putting atoms together. And both of these make energy because of E equals MC squared. This is what's happening in the sun and other stars, that's the sun. Um, it gives off uh, energy because of e equals mc squared. That is what Einstein's famous formula is all about, is that matter and energy can be converted, and where they are converted is in nuclear bombs and uh, the sun and other stars. Why does this, so now when you're a mom or dad and your little kid says, why does the sun shine? You can say e equals mc squared. Matter is being converted into energy. Okay, so we have to balance these things. Nature likes balance. These are nuclear equations, and I'm going to show you how to balance them. Now scroll up. Time to scroll. Oof, more fun with sound effects. Are we good with that? Don't scroll too fast. Okay, so for these problems, uh, you get the number, the atomic number from the periodic table, but sometimes they're subatomic particles, and you memorize what the symbol is. Okay, so if this is a neutron, how many protons does a neutron have? Well, we'll say zero. Okay. Protons have how many protons? One. Electrons have how many protons? Zero. Zero, but what is the charge of an electron? Negative one, okay? So this math works. Remember, our arrows are zero. So one minus one is zero. Let's see if I can do that better. Okay? One plus zero is one. Everybody cool so far? Okay? These are the symbols for those things. Now, also, you're going to learn a secret. A secret of the universe. Okay? If you take a neutron and you hit it hard enough, it splits into a proton and an electron. So that's kind of cool, and that's why a neutron has the same mass as a proton, because remember, electrons is so little that it's like they don't even have mass, and that's why they're neutral, because one minus one is zero. Okay, so that's so that would be our neutrino, and then um, some other particles there. Okay, so how so this is showing a balanced chemical equation. This is americium. You would look on the periodic table and find that its number is 95. So everybody look over at americium, number 95. Can you see it? See the 95 is the blue number there, okay? And those go on the bottom. The top number, if you remember from our FET interactive computer lab, is the protons plus the neutrons, it's the mass, okay? So neptunium is 93 and helium is two. And the math works. Because 93 plus 2 is 95, 237 plus 4 is 241. Now I'm going to pause and make sure everybody understands this so far. Everybody look at it. Your arrow is your equals. Do you, you follow the math signs and do you see how the top and bottom are what they're supposed to be? Okay. So on this one, iodine is 53, xenon is 54. 54 and electrons are minus 1. 54 minus 1 is 53. <coughs> Excuse me. 131 plus 0 is 131. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's do another one. Radon, I mean, radium is 88, radon is 86. Helium is 2, gamma is 0. 86 plus 2 plus 0 is 88. 222 plus 4 plus 0 is 226. So this one breaks apart into radon, helium, and some gamma particles. Cobalt 27 uh, breaks into nickel, which is 28, an electron, and a gamma particle. Okay, so this is what the problems are more like on the test, okay? So uranium is 92, and thorium is 90. So what goes there? What can we add to 90 to get 92? Helium. Helium, yes. So that'd be 2, 4, helium, and we could have done an alpha particle there. Let's check the top. 229 plus 4, 233. 
Okay, try the next one. What do you think is missing there? Neptunium is 93, and I would have put these in, but Word won't write numbers on top of each other like this, so I had to just leave them out. Uh, and, I, and this way you see where they come from. What should go there? What's missing? What do we do to 94 to get it to 93? Yes. Electron. It's an electron. It's minus one zero electron. It's a beta particle. Okay, how about this one? Here I've got copper, which is 29. I've got an electron. If it doesn't tell you, you, you know, don't ever assume it's a positron, just assume it's an electron unless it tells you otherwise. What is it going to make? What minus one is 29? Zinc. Zinc. It's 30. Y'all are jumping ahead. Good job. So that's 30. It looks like 80 is 30. That zinc. And what should I put on the top? What number goes on top? It should be 66 because 66 plus zero is 66. Okay, beryllium is number four. Carbon is number six. What should I add to beryllium to get copper? Helium. What plus four is six? He said it, it's helium. So sometimes the thing you're adding is in the products. Sometimes it's in the reactants. It could be on either side of the arrow. Okay, look at the next one while I'm scrolling and see if you can figure it out. What do you think is missing on the next one? Okay, what number is, is carbon? Six. six, so both of these are sixes. What do I add to six to get six? Zero. What do I add to 12 to get 13? One, what symbol has a one over a zero? And I'm hearing it, the neutron. So that one's a neutron. Okay, so P is 15, neutrons have a zero, what's it gonna make? What's phosphorus plus a neutron? It's gonna be phosphorus. Still gonna be phosphorus, because 15 plus zero is 15. What's 32 plus one? 33. That's easy, isn't it? Yeah. So we're going to do some of those. There, there'll be a few a little bit more complicated, and I'll give you a worksheet on it tomorrow to practice it. If you are going on the field trip, you might want to get your worksheet today or come by in the morning and get it. Okay, so there's another concept that goes with nuclear chemistry, and it is half-life. And it's the time it takes, you guessed it, one half of the sample to decay. So imagine that I have a cup of carbon-14. That's a nuclear radioactive isotope. I have a cup of it. In a certain amount of time, half of it is going to become something else. It's going to become nitrogen, okay? So it's going to, it's going to decompose and become something else. And, and they used to think back in the 80s, when I was a teenager, when I was your age, that this was super regular, that we could make atomic clocks, that we could, that we could date bones, that we could date artifacts, that this was the key for us to understand it, it to time in some ways, because they thought it was more regular than anything else, and it was going to unlock all these possibilities, like dating artifacts. It, it, the 80s were a long time ago, right? Well, this has actually changed. And now they have discovered that half-life is not as consistent as they thought it was and that, um, that it, it does not work the way we thought it did. But education is slow. I read the current research, the books, what the standards take, take a long time to change. So we're going to pretend like we don't know that that we don't know that half-life is not as steady as we thought it was. And we're going to do half-life problems pretending like it's absolutely steady, okay? But just know that this is another area that you could grow up and figure out, but um, half-life is not as constant as they thought it was. I, I hope I'm not disillusioning you with science here. Science is as all-knowing as we thought. Okay, carbon-14 decays to carbon-12. Uh, and now I got 5,715 out of this book right here. 
but Mr. Myrick said it's 5,712, which sounds more right to me. So we'll put an asterisk by that and we'll look that up, okay? But I copied that down out of the whole Visualizing Matter book and it could have been a typo and I just wrote it down. So anyway, but anyway, it takes carbon about 5,700 years to become something else, okay? And when it does, it emits beta particles. Okay, it emits beta particles. So yeah, that's a little fishy, but I got it out of that whole book. I need to go get it out of a different book. But we can learn the concept without it being exactly right. We can make it a pretend element. Okay, so see, and that's why the other thing is it says carbon-12, but, but this does not add up to carbon-12. Okay, here's our beta particle. So carbon is six, negative one. What minus one is six? What, what minus one is six? Seven. Does somebody say seven? Seven minus one is six. So this would be nitrogen. And what, what plus zero is 14? 14. So that's the reaction that, I, that, uh, that would be correct if it's emitting beta particles. Okay. All right, I gotta fix my graph. I kind of messed it up. Got a race here. All right, let me show you how this works. Okay, this is how it works no matter what the details. Okay, so you start off with a cup of radioactive substance. At that point, you have 100% of it, and no lives have gone by, no half-lives. Then one half-life goes by, and if it was for carbon, it'd be the 5,715. And then after that, you only have 50%. Okay, so you start off with zero, you have 100%. Put a dot on your graph. After one life, you have 50% put a dot. So how much would you have left? Now your 50% is your 100%. Now that 50%, half of it's going to go away. What is half of 50? 25. So now you go half of the half and you're to 25. What's half of 25? 12.5. So go half of the half and put a dot. What's half of 12.5? Yes, yeah, somebody said 6.25. And uh, go half of the half and put a dot. What's half of 6.25? You may know. 3.125. Yep, I heard somebody say it. So go half of the half and put a dot. Oop, we're filling sound effects. And half of 3.125 is 1.5. Whoops, that didn't write. Five, that looks like a six. Five, six, two, five. But you don't have to memorize those. You'll do them on your calculator. Go half of the half and put a dot. Now in math, you learn about asymptotes. That's always fun to say. I, from the reaction from first period, y'all have not learned this yet. You won't learn it till algebra two. But what it is, is you will eventually do graphs that look like this over on the board. And what it is, I'll draw one over here for the pleasure of the viewing audience. So they won't be left out. There are things in math that you're going to graph. I'm going to change it to black. And it makes a graph that looks like that. Or it could look like this. And there's a lot of these. And they could be on the XY axis the way I drew it. Or it could be somewhere else. But in math, these lines approach something and never get to it. It goes for infinity. Remember the infinity symbol is like that? Whoop. More full of sound effects, okay? So this is going toward negative infinity, positive infinity, positive infinity, negative infinity, depending on X or Y, okay? That line is getting close to, but never touching, is called the asymptote. That's fun to say. Okay, so in a way, our line here is approaching an asymptote, but unlike math, shh, unlike math, if you have a question, ask me. Unlike math, eventually all the atoms will decay. So in math, it goes for infinity and never touches it. 
in Half-Life Graph, eventually it would touch the line. But, see, if we did it in math, we would say, walk halfway to the door, and you would do it. Now walk halfway to the door, and you would do it. Now walk halfway to the door. What, would you ever get to the door? No. No, because it would always be halfway. So that's how it's in. We can, it could be infinity to get to the door, because you're never allowed to go to the door. You're only allowed to go halfway to the door. Does that make sense? Are we still blowing your mind today? Blowing your mind with math and science. I love it. So one of the things you have to memorize is what does a half-life graph look like? It's that. We're going to do a half-life lab. I used to do it with pennies where we flip pennies, but it's very, very noisy and annoying. And Miss Raymond had a better idea to use M&Ms. So we're going to do the half-life penny lab with M&Ms, and you will have an opportunity to eat them if you wish. You don't have to. You never have to eat your lab equipment in here, but sometimes you get the opportunity to. And we're going to do a half-life lab where you'll create that graph with M&Ms. So, like I said, we're not really using real radioisotopes. We're not really going to give you cancer. We're going to do things for this unit, like eat M&Ms. So this might be your favorite one, the one where we don't really use real chemicals. Okay, isotopes and average atomic mass. We learned this in our last unit, but you're going to be tested out more this time. Isotopes, remember our cats over there? Uh, our fat cat and our thin cat, they're both cats, so they are like isotopes. They have more or less neutrons, and you learn this in your FET interactive, interactive lab. Remember the isotopes part of it? Okay, they always, if it's the same, um, if they're isotopes of one another, they always have the same number of protons. The same protons, just like these are both cats, but one's fat and one's thin. Some isotopes have special names of hydrogen. Proteum is just a proton. It's one hydrogen, a proton. But deuterium, what do you think deuterium's mass is? Not one, but two, because deut is another prefix that means two. What do you think tritium is? Three, like a tricycle. Tricycle. Okay. So those are some special ones that have special names. Now we already learned this. Why are the masses in decimals on the periodic table? They are weighted averages. Weighted, just like your grades. All right, so here is an example problem, one of the kind of problems that will be on this test. Can I scroll it all? So I'm going to read you the problem. Copper has two naturally occurring isotopes, copper 63 with an abundance of 69.17 and copper 65 with an abundance of 30.83. What is the average molar mass of copper? Actually, I'm going to write this here because I wrote it over there, but they can't see it on TV. Okay. Do you remember sixth grade? Get in your way back machine, go back to sixth grade. Do -do 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 -do. That's the way back machine, okay? Where you learned how to convert decimals and percents. How do I do it? Tell me. What? Fractions have something to do with it, but not, not this. It did in sixth grade, but not now. Sixth grade, you would go one half, 50%, or point, point 0.5. So you move the decimal point to go from a percent to a decimal. So we want these in our problems to be decimals. Do I move my decimal to the right or the left? Yeah. Left, how many places? Two, and how you remember that is the percent sign has two circles to remind you to move it two places. So if we were gonna change this one, here we go, whoop, whoop, and my decimal would be there, more fun with sound effects. And if I was gonna move this one, whoop, whoop, and my decimal would go there. Everybody remember that from sixth grade? Very good. Do you know studies show that people don't remember middle school, any of their learning? That middle school, all that learning you do is usually forgotten. Middle school kids have so many hormones going through their brains that it really prevents them from learning. So there are some people who feel like everybody should just be sent home for those three years. Every, that we shouldn't even have middle school, they should just be homeschooled or not. They can just hang out at home and play video games for three years. 
Don't tell that to a middle school teacher. They'll be all mad, but that's what some of the studies show. Okay, so how you do these problems? I want you to list your isotopes vertically. Then you're going to write the percents as a decimal. So 0. 0.6917 and 0. 0.3083. Now I have to apologize because I used X not for an unknown variable but for times. But the reason why is word was not written for science and you can't make it put a dot in the middle. It always wants the dot to be a decimal down at the bottom. So just know that means time, sorry. If I was handwriting this, I wouldn't have done that, but we had to. And you multiply them. So 63 times 0.6917 is 43.5771. 65 times 0.3083 is 20.5771. 0395. Then you draw your addition bar and write a plus and add them up. And it's 63.6166. So that would be the molar mass of copper on the periodic table. Is it? Emily, look over there at that periodic table. Is it 63.6166? Yes. Is it? Read, read out to me what number it's got. Six, three, five, four, six. So she said, read it to me again, Emily. Six, three, point, five, four, six. So those are not the same. Any idea why we got the wrong answer according to our periodic table? Yes. Because not all of them are the same. Yes. What, what it is is that periodic tables are based on current mining data of what these these percentages come from current mining data and the data changes maybe they find a, a deposit where it's lots of copper 65 instead of 63 then that number on new periodic tables would be slightly different they're pretty close but slightly different so you always, um, so when you see periodic tables and those numbers are a little different, you know why. And so an older periodic table might have a slightly different number. That's okay. Just use the periodic table in college that your teacher set tells you to use. And like, we'll be using that one I passed out to you in class. Okay? All right. All right, let's move it right along. Here's, oh, I have another problem here first. Okay, so here's another problem. Which isotope is most abundant? I'm not telling you the abundance. Oxygen's isotopes are 16, 17, and 18. You discovered that when we did our FET interactive. How can we figure out which one is most abundant without someone telling us the abundances? Any guess? Here's my clue. Periodic table, what does it say the mass of oxygen is? 16. So which one is the most abundant, do you think? 16. So the, the, the one on the periodic table is 15.999. That's, that's about 16. So we know the oxygen 16 is the most abundant because it's the closest to the number on the periodic table. That makes sense? Okay. Now let's move up to our next idea. New idea. How the isotopes are going to electrons? Isotopes have to do with neutrons. We're going to go talk about electrons now. This is called quantum chemistry or quantum physics. It's the modern view of the atom, okay? Electrons can be described as a particle or a wave. And I'm gonna show you a little demonstration of why, why we know that, okay? Um, they can leap between energy levels. Remember on our Bohr model, we learned about these energy levels and when we saw in the video the electrons can jump up and jump down between those energy levels. And what is that jump called? Oh, quantum, quantum leap. leap. That's right. It's a quantum leap when they jump between them. See, don't you just feel smart learning all this? A quantum leap. Okay. When they're at the bottom, it's called the ground state. When they're not hopped up when they're where they're supposed to be. When they get all hopped up it's called the excited state they get excited and we're gonna excite them we're gonna do a lab on tuesday 
where we're going to excite some electrons and make them hop up. Um, where they hang out in the quantum thing, the energy levels that they hang out in, so I'm going to put big E is energy level. Each in, well, there's energy levels. Within the energy level, there are, uh, they hang out in electron clouds. They hang out in clouds. Clouds. I want you just to add that to your note. Those clouds are called orbitals. Those clouds are called orbitals, and they're where the electron can be found 90% of the time. So we draw them smooth, but on your FET interactive computer, did anybody click? So it showed the atoms, did it show the clouds? Did anybody click on that? So the electrons where they really hang out, we'll draw them the smooth little things like those rings over there in our Bohr model. That would really be an inner cloud and an outer cloud, and it's where they can be found 90% of the time. Another thing I want you to add to your notes right here is it's called the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. Heisenberg. That's very important. <laughs> Heisenberg uncertainty principle. The Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Just stick it in right there. And it's that you can't know an electron's position and speed at the same time. So you can't know. Position and we'll, we'll use the science word velocity. So velocity is speed and direction. Okay, and that's his, his principle. You can't know the position and velo velocity both, and this is how it works. You got an electron moving along. You want to find its speed and position. You get its position. To do so, you stop it and it doesn't have any speed anymore. Or you get its speed, and by the time you get its speed, its position has changed. Does that make sense? That's what Heisenberg figured out. You cannot know for sure in this cloud, in this cloud, we should draw a little cloud around the cloud. In the cloud, you can't know exactly where it is and how fast it's going at the same time. The Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. Okay, so when these atoms jump back down out of their excited state, they give off electromagnetic radiation. When they leap down, energy levels. And they give off, Ronald McDonald is very ugly, extra gross, the ra this spectrum. So radio waves, this is AM radio, FM radio, and it's also TV, regular old TV, not digital or, or anything like that, but just regular old TV that used to go through the air and people had antennas on their house and stuff. That kind, those are all radio waves. Microwaves are in ovens, but they're also in phones. Your phone works on microwave. So one of the things I, when I got here, there were signs on the, all the doors, caution, microwaving use. That was pacemakers when they very first made them, probably back in the 70s, it would have affected it. All of you are carrying around phones, so it was a little, it was a little funny. Then nobody realized, oh, we don't have to put caution, microwaving use ever again, because new pacemakers do not are not affected and if they were if you got your cell phone out around somebody then they'd just have a heart attack and they don't do they in fact a person with a pacemaker can put their cell phone in their breast pocket and be okay because of that so it was a little a little unscientific i went around and took down all the caution microwaving use signs because it was a little embarrassing because as a school we should have known but i read the current research and not everybody does so that's all right Okay, infrared is the part that you feel as heat. You know your toaster gets red and get, gives off heat. Uh, visible, that's Roy G. Biv. 
You know what I mean by Roy G. Biv? That's the colors of the rainbow. Roy G. Biv is a colorful man at the rainbow's end. Have y'all heard that by They Might Be Giants? Should have heard as a little kid. As a little kid song, you might need to go back and listen to it. They Might Be Giants, Roy G. Biv. UV, this will give you a tan. It darkens your skin. It also gives you skin cancer. So don't believe the lie when they say their tanning bed will give you a, a tan without giving you skin cancer. It's a lie. <coughs> One time I had a student, and she said, Miss Blackbird, people just need to be happy with the color they are and not try to get a tan. And I've always thought she was right. People should just be happy the color they are, not try to change it. X-ray, uh, that's for your broken bones. Gamma rays, it turns Bruce Banner into the Hulk. But actually, it's real high energy. That will definitely give you some cancer, X-rays and gamma rays. All right, let's scroll on down. Okay, so electrons. They, they, they have... Uh, every electron hangs out in a different place in the atom. Nobody, no two electrons are hanging out in the same exact place, okay? They can hang out in the different energy levels. They can hang out in different clouds, but no two are going to hang out at exactly the same place at the same time. Yes? So what do we put for gamma rays? Gamma rays, they're just high energy. They're, 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 they're very high energy, and they'll certainly give you some cancer. Um, okay, so there are four numbers. Every electron is in a different place. So there are four numbers that will tell you exactly where it is. It's like an address. It's like there are a bunch of billions of people in the world. Sometimes you hear nine billion, sometimes you hear seven. Nine billion if they want to convince you that the world is overpopulated. Seven seems to be more a reasonable number, but we don't know. We haven't counted exactly every person on earth, but there's billions of us, right? Billions of people on earth. But I could write a letter, and it could get to Kindle, okay? Uh, so of all the 9 billion people in the world, I could write it to the United States. That would rule out all those other people who aren't in the United States. I could write it to Georgia. That would rule out all 49 other states. I could write it to Dallas, and that would rule out all other cities in Georgia. I could write it to her street, and that would rule out every other street in Dallas. I could write her house number on it, and that would rule out every other house on her street. I write her name on it, and that rules out every other person in her family. So out of all the billions and billions of people, I could have just her address. Do you understand that? Same thing with atoms, but atoms, they only need four numbers. And the four numbers will tell you where in the atom that electron is. Okay, and they are called the four quantum numbers. So, of course, this is confusing. It's quantum physics. Nobody said quantum physics is easy, right? So, but y'all are smart enough to learn it, okay? So, the very first number, you get four numbers. The first one is designated by the lowercase letter N. It's the N quantum number. N for number, okay? It also has a special name. It is called the principal quantum number. <clears throat> That's a special name. So, it's first quantum number, N quantum number, the principal quantum number. And it tells you which level it lives on. So, on my periodic table here, <laughs> more fun with sound effects, you notice that I have seven numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's the principal quantum numbers. That's the first quantum number. So, the first number tells which of those seven levels it lives on. Good so far? Excellent. Okay. The next number is, tells you the shape of its orbital. It is also given a letter, and it's lowercase cursive. That's why you might have learned cursive. Uh, L. It's an L. That's an L. Okay? So, it tells you the shape of the orbital. Now, we have learned about S orbitals, those round ones under there. Those are round orbitals, but they can come in other shapes. Okay? So, the L number goes one through th zero through three. And so there are four different shapes that orbitals can come in. The first one, if it's got the letter, the number zero, that means it is called an S-shaped orbital, and it is S for sphere. 
It is a sphere shaped. And that's the ones that we did in our Bohr models. We drew circles, we put electrons in it. Those would have been S orbitals for the first two there. They are spheres. So, so circles only come in one variety, right? Spheres are all sphere shaped. So there's only one type of sphere. Okay, good so far? Not too bad, okay. If the, if the second number is number one, that means that that, that is considered a P-shaped room, and it looks like, they say in the textbooks it's dumbbell-shaped. I don't, I've never seen a dumbbell, somebody lifting weights, and it look like that, because that's what it looks like. It looks like a number eight, except it's 3D. It can be vertically, it can be horizontally, or it can be coming out at you. So it can be on the x-axis, the y-axis, or the z-axis. Have you learned about z yet? So x, y, there's a z coming straight out at you. So the p orbital can be x, uh, y, x, or z. <laughs> okay, still good? And so there's three types. Those are the three types of p orbitals. Okay, for uh, the number two, those are called d orbitals. Okay, and they look like a fat plus sign. Like that, a fat plus sign. They can be on the x and y, or they can be in between x and y. So they can be like this, or they can be like that. And they can be between X and Y, or whoop, they can be between Z and Y. They can be X and Y, or they can be Z and Y. They can be between X and Y, or they can be between Z and Y. So I'm gonna just, I can't draw a Z, I'm not that good, but I'm just gonna draw it again, and this would be coming out at you is your, is your other orientation. Now there's one more, and to me it looks like two baby pacifiers stuck together. So there are five different D ones. This, 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 that, and then the baby bottle pacifiers, baby pacifiers. So there's five of them. Now F's are very complicated. I say F is for fuzzy. And I'm not even going to try to draw them. So just draw seven little fuzzy balls here. They're very fancy. And there are seven different ones. And I'm going to teach you a little bit more about this, but I'm afraid to give you too much at once. So we're going to leave that one right there. Okay. There's one more thing about how to do the next number but I'm going to teach it to you later. So there's a better drawing of them. S, P, see there's the P on the x-axis. D, that's one that's in between Z and Y. And there's a fuzzy F. Okay, the third quantum number is one I'm going to teach you more about later. It tells you which way it's oriented, and it's M sub L. And the fourth one tells you which way it spins, and it's called M sub S. The electrons rotate on their axis like a planet. And they either go clockwise or counterclockwise, which is designated by plus or minus one half. Okay, electron configurations must follow the rules. So now we're gonna write the list of the electrons in an atom. And there's a song. 1s2, 2s2, and then comes 2p6. Electron configurations, yes, they're really slick. We'll sing the song more when we do the lab for it. Okay. So there are rules for doing the electron configurations. The first one is called Hun's rule. I call this the kid's rule, okay? And it's that the electrons don't share a room until everybody's got a room first. So if you get married and have kids and you've got a three bedroom house, you and your spouse get one bedroom. You have your first kid, they get a bedroom. You have your second kid, they get a bedroom. But here comes third kid, oh no, what are you gonna do? Somebody sharing a room, right? Right? So some of y'all were that first kid who was very unhappy about more coming, but that happened. 
chihendral. They each get an orbital before they double up. The next one is called Pauli's exclusion principle. And this is if they share a room, one will spin clockwise and one will spin counterclockwise, which are designated by arrows going up and down. The next rule is the lowest energy level fills first. They like the lowest energy first. And we heard that from uh, our, our video. He talked about that. Okay, there is a way to figure out the order they fill using this chart, but you're not going to do that. That's the baby way. I'm going to teach you how to do it using the periodic table. <laughs> There's also a shortcut way, and all of this will make more sense. We're going to do an activity with it, called the noble gas configuration. So this is how we do the configuration for hydrogen. Hydrogen has one electron. It's on the first level. Okay, it is an s orbital, and it's got one electron in there. Helium is also on the first level. I wrote two. It's supposed to be one. That's what me getting ahead of myself. But it's got two electrons, and we can see that for our periodic table. One, and there's two squares over. Scroll down to lithium. There, y'all got those. One s one, one s two. Okay, so lithium's first two electrons go into an S ring, but then its next electron also goes into an S ring. Let me show you on this periodic table. Lithium. Lithium. Its first electrons go into one S orbital. Its second electron, and it's, well, it's its third ring, its next electron, is on the second level in an S root. See my S, D, P, and F? I'm going to teach you how to write that over a periodic table and do it. Okay, so nitrogen. Let me show you nitrogen and then we'll write it down. Nitrogen is right here. So its first two electrons go in the 1S, its next two electrons go in the 2S, its next four electrons go in the 2P, and we've got one, two, three of them. Okay, if this is absolutely crazy to you, don't worry. We're going to play a game and sing a song, and it will get better. So that's nitrogen. Now, how do you do the noble gas? You look before it. And, it, and you say, it's just like the noble gas, but. So the noble gas that is before lithium is helium. Do you see how lithium's three and helium's two? So you say, same as helium by putting it in square brackets, and then you write what's different, 2S1. Nitrogen, the noble gas before it, is also helium. Same as helium, except it's... 2s2, 2p3. And we're going to work on this more. And on the test, you'll do both, noble gas and regular. All right. This last little bit uh, we learned from our video. This should only take a second here. Remember, Mr. Morrison, Dr. Morrison, he went around and showed us the, the lights, the little broken rainbows. Oh, yeah. Those are called bright line emission spectrum. If you excite the electrons with heat or electricity, they'll jump up. And we're going to do that in our lab. We're going to excite them with heat and electricity. They give off energy as light in the order of the rainbow. Because each atom has a unique orbital pattern, they give off unique light. Bands of light like a broken rainbow, little pieces of broken rainbow in the order of Roy G. Bell. So he said it's an atomic fingerprint, if you will, how he said it. And it looks like that. Remember, we saw that. Now then, chemical versus physical property. A chemical property is how it reacts, how it changes as it reacts with other chemicals. So remember, what's the symbol for change? Triangle. How it changes. A physical property, it doesn't change. 
it's without changing, and emission spectrum is a physical property. We don't change it to see this, we just observe it. And the other thing to review, states of matter, solid, liquid, gas, and plasma, lowest energy, highest energy, and we'll learn more about that in thermochemistry. Last thing, turn to the last page, and there's a little problem for honors only. Regular, this is part of your differentiation. Here's a problem. We have some, some isotopes of silicon, 28, 29, and 30. Notice we didn't use the mass 28, 29, and 30. We used this decimal point mass. Why do you think these have a decimal point mass? This does not go with what we have learned. Any idea about why is this is a decimal? It's this. Uh, Y'all probably couldn't come up with it. Remember E equals MC squared? How matter can be changed to energy? In the nucleus of an atom, there is tremendous force, strong force holding the positive parts together. That force is converting just a tiny bit. Notice how close those decimals are to the element whole number. They're turning just a tiny bit of matter into energy and make it weigh just a little bit less. I just wanted you to see that because you're going to go to college and these are going to have decimal ones and it might confuse you. But now you know, you got a little E equals MC squared happening there. All right, y'all did awesome. We made it. Yay. All right, like, share, subscribe.